Our glorious God, Jehovah, we're very pleased and thankful that we can gather together for this uh, spiritual upbuilding. We appreciate having this special week of activity wherein Brother and Sister Berdine and Brother and Sister Frank will be here with us and uh, share with us in field service as well as uh, the spiritual food we will have here tonight. And uh, capping it off with the circuit assembly uh, this coming weekend. So uh, we realize, Jehovah, that we will benefit from these things if we listen, if we uh, listen with both our hearts as well as our minds, and put into practice the many things we will learn. This weekend at the assembly, we want to be able to learn how we more fully may subject ourselves to you, and we pray that uh, you help us to be obedient, willing to obey, so that we can fully benefit. But we appreciate this uh, attention on your part and the part of your organization it keeps us spiritually alert in these wicked times, and we pray that uh, it can keep us strong and close to you at all times. Please bless the governing body and the faithful slave which provides us this uh, spiritual food in due time, and uh, we pray that uh, you will prepare us all for the work ahead as we endeavor to bring more and more people into the truth. So we express our appreciation for all these blessings you've given us, and we ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we invite all of you to uh, take your Bibles and give attention to Brother Frank as uh, he talks to us on the subject, Jehovah, the Maker of Precious Stones. I want to say at the outset that we appreciate very much your welcome to us, the hospitality extended to us. It's very much appreciated. I know I speak in behalf of the Verdeens too. And this week, uh, as uh, was mentioned in the prayer, of course, we'll climax with the circuit assembly. So when uh, this program is over this evening, we want to give each one of you a program so that uh, possibly by using it and seeing what's on the program, it may be the incentive to help some of that you're studying with to uh, be with us on the weekend. In fact, if you have uh, any Bible studies in the morning that you can't move uh, to the afternoon, why, one of the four of us would be happy to go with you because maybe uh, getting acquainted with them and filling them in a little bit on what the program is about may be the break that uh, starts them moving toward the truth in, in the way of association. So you might think about that relative to our week's activity. And then, of course, the theme of the circuit assembly is subjecting ourselves to God. And it's a marvelous program and very, very uh, timely in that it deals with that subject from about every facet you can think of. So uh, I know you're looking forward to it, and I know you're going to enjoy it. I've uh, chosen this theme on this talk because uh, many times when you're studying with people and uh, they begin to realize they have certain responsibilities toward the Creator, relative to what they're learning from his word, the Bible, they wonder sometimes why they're put under a certain amount of pressure. In fact, one individual, when he was starting to attend meetings, he said, you know, I read in the Bible where Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But he said, ever since I come to the meetings, all I hear about is a lot of work. He said, uh, where's the freedom? So he had a good question, and it needed some answering, didn't it? Well, we can understand this. Uh, we can appreciate that Jehovah God uh, has always spoken of those that are dedicated to him and serving him as a very prized possession, precious possession. He refers to us, uh, his people, as a choice and very dear possession. You might turn in your Bible to... Isaiah 43, and notice a relative to his people at that time. And this is Isaiah 43, verse 1. Now he said, uh, this is what Jehovah has said, your creator, O Jacob, and notice this, and your former, O Israel, do not be afraid, for I have repurchased you, I have called you by your name, and you are mine. And then down in verse 4, he says, owing to the fact that you have been precious in my eyes, you have been considered honorable, and I myself have loved you. I shall give men in place of you and national groups in place of your soul. Do not be afraid, 
For I am with you, from the sun rising I shall bring you seed, from the sunset I shall collect you together, and I shall say to the north, give up, to the south, do not keep back, bring my sons from far off, my daughters from the extremity of the earth, everyone that is called by my name, and that I have created for my own glory, and then notice again that I have formed, yes, that I have made, and then of course that famous 10th verse where he says you are my witnesses so uh, we can appreciate that he forms his witnesses he's always had witnesses on the face of the earth Jesus when he was on the earth he referred to uh, Jehovah's people as the salt of the earth a very prized uh, commodity and then of course Jehovah refers to his own son as a living stone that uh, Peter writes about him saying that he's a living stone rejected it's true by men but chosen and precious with God so now here he's referring to his own son as a precious stone now what does uh, John for example use in Revelation the fourth chapter uh, what do you imagine he would use to try to describe Jehovah God how would you describe Jehovah well, here in uh, Revelation 4, 3, now he says, The one seated is in appearance like a jasper stone, a precious red-colored stone, and around about the throne there was an emerald, uh, a rainbow like an emerald in appearance. So now he's using uh, precious stones to try to describe Jehovah. A very interesting point. We... Uh, can appreciate what makes a stone precious. One thing is they're rare, they're not easy to find, and one of the qualities that contributes to the preciousness of a stone is its durability. But how were these gemstones formed that we find in the earth? That John is talking about here, rubies, uh, emeralds, diamonds, sapphires. Well, the geologists tell us that uh, because of subjecting the carbons in the earth to tremendous pressure and heat, this is what formed these crystals that uh, become precious gems as we know them today. And of course, you sisters don't have to be convinced of that. You remember when you received a precious stone from someone that thought a lot about you, we don't have to discuss the preciousness from that standpoint, do we, obviously. But men know, too, uh, the value of precious gemstones because they'll, they'll risk their lives to get into the earth, try to find them. They will move tons of dirt, risk their lives. They get discouraged, obviously, at times, but they know they're there, and so they keep searching, searching, searching. And they know that if they can find any of any size, why, they could retire for life. In fact, the largest diamond that has ever been found is about the size of a man's fist. How would you like to find that? You know you could retire for life, couldn't you? Even if you were 10 years old, you could retire. <laughs> sure. And uh, I was reading in the, the Awake, an older issue, where this individual was uh, in Brazil. He's walking to town. And he's just going down a, a dry riverbed, just walking to town, and uh, wasn't particularly looking for anything, but he happened to kick a stone, and it rolled, and it looked a little different. So he picked it up, it was about the size of an egg, and it was different. So he took it into town to have it analyzed, and it turned out to be a diamond worth $10,000, just laying on the surface of the ground. You might say he found it in an informal way, how valuable that was. So we can appreciate here, when we're talking about precious stones, we can appreciate them from the standpoint of the physical stone, gemstones. But now Jehovah, he's talking about his people. He said, I formed you. And uh, he says through Isaiah there, he'll bring them in from the north, south, east, west from the four corners of the earth. And then, of course, in uh, Haggai, the second chapter, uh, here's a scripture that'll be used at the circuit assembly. 
But just briefly, it adds to what Isaiah was saying. And uh, you find here on page uh, 1038 in one of the New World translations, chapter 2. Uh, someone might read, if you would, from verse 6 to 9, Haggai 2. Please, sister. For this is what you told of armies and said, Yet once it is a little while, and I am rocking the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry ground. And I will rock all the nations, and the desirable things of all the nations must come in. And I will fill this house with glory, the Jehovah of armies has said. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, is the utterance of Jehovah of armies. Greater will the glory of this later house become than that of the former, Jehovah of armies has said. And in this place I shall give peace, is the utterance of Jehovah of armies. Thank you. So now here's another prophet saying that Jehovah would bring in these desirable ones from all the nations, so like Isaiah, from the four corners of the earth. And uh, reading one more here in e Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, notice what Jehovah brings out here. This is Ezekiel 34, 11. Now he said, this is what the Lord Jehovah has said. Here I am, I myself, and I will search for my sheep and care for them. And then turn the page to verse 29. He said, I will raise up for them a planting for a name. They will no more become those taken away by famine in the land, and they will no longer bear the humiliation by the nations. And they will have to know that I, Jehovah their God, am with them, and they are my people. The house of Israel is the utterance of the Lord Jehovah. And as regards you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasturing, you are earthling men. I am your God, is the utterance of the Lord Jehovah. So... The thought that comes to us after reading these scriptures is the question, is Jehovah doing this? Uh, is he moving the people, the desirable ones of the nations, to come into his pasturing? Ha is he directing them? Well, at one of the uh, circuit assemblies, I heard this experience where a sister placed a truth book with a housewife and uh, made the arrangements for a Bible study the following week, set the time, and then told the householder to just look through the book and pick a chapter. And then when she comes back, she says, we'll just go into that chapter and use your Bible and, and to show you how we study the Bible. So when the sister came back at the appointed time, she asked the householder if she'd read and what she decided she wanted to investigate. Well, she said, uh, when you left, of course, I wanted the book, so I just looked in the beginning, and I, I started reading. And she said, I got so interested, really. She said that since you're here, I, I just read the whole book. And I've enjoyed it so much. In fact, she said, for the first time in my life, I can begin to realize what God's purpose is and what he expects us to do. So she said, since you're here, I not only read the book, but... I just took it upon myself to call on my neighbors. She said, I've been to all my neighbors on this side of the street. And I crossed the street, went to all of those over there, and called on these back to my house. Now what should I do? <laughs> that doesn't happen every day. But who moved her? This is the point. Uh, is Jehovah moving his sheep? And to give them the insight, and the understanding, and the appreciation of his message. Certainly he is. And then Jesus, of course, showed uh, his disciples that those precious stones are out there. And so he instructs his disciples, you recall, in uh, Matthew 10, 11, to start searching them out, just like a miner. Search them out and find out who is deserving. You remember that. The phraseology is, into whatever city you enter, search out who in it is deserving. Well, now, what are they deserving? What did Jesus mean? Search out in it who is deserving. What do they deserve, do you think? Sister? All right, they deserve that, and, and they deserve something else before they're going to get that. Sister? They deserve to hear about God's 
Right. Sister Frank? They deserve our time. They deserve a Bible study. They, they de deserve the knowledge. So when they're searched out, they just don't come right on into the truth, do they? They deserve a, a Bible study, a, a, a beautiful thought. So really, in this searching work, you can kind of see that we're in a very similar position as that miner that goes into the earth searching for uh, precious stones. Have you ever seen a miner's map, any of you? Maybe not in Kansas, eh? <laughs> but I know up in uh, where they search for gold and silver and also precious stones, a miner's map really is it's nothing but lines on a flat piece of paper. And of course you have the main tunnel and then you have the laterals, which are lines going out to the side. And he always has this map because he tells whoever's on the surface where he's working that day in case he gets into trouble, they can find him. Well, when we decide to go into searching work, we ask the ministerial servant, probably, to give us a map. And that's just a piece of paper with lines on it. Isn't that true? And we go out into the service and head down those laterals and start chipping away or ringing doorbells, searching, searching, searching for prospective precious stones. And that's why when individuals are in the territory, they're getting away from this idea of what did you place in the way of literature. The question is, what did you find? What did you find? And of course, it takes a little ingenuity to be able to find these prospective precious stones. And that's why in the kingdom service, we get ideas, the pioneer school, kingdom ministry school, give us ideas relative to developing our effectiveness in the search. If you'll turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 14, here's a scripture you've read more than once. But notice how it involves this searching work. 1 Corinthians 14. And someone could read verses 8 and 9 for us. Sister, please. For truly, if the trumpet sounds and anything calls, who will get ready for battle? In the same way also, unless you through the tongue utter speech, if it is understood, how will it be known what is being spoken? You will in fact be speaking into the air. Yes. I think we've all read that more than once. But what a beautiful illustration here. Now, Paul is talking about an army. We can understand that. He's talking about a bugle call or a trumpet, and uh, it alerts the army. Well, now, an army between battles will rest, and some of the soldiers will fall asleep. But while that's happening, all of a sudden, here comes a bugle call. Now, some of them that have been asleep wake up because of the bugle. But they start talking among themselves. And they're saying, was that charge or retreat? <laughs> they're not sure. But they heard it. Now, how does that apply in field service? Well, I was with a brother, and uh, we were in magazine work. He went to this door, and the woman, when she saw the magazine, she said, oh, the watch turned away. She said, I enjoy these magazines. Just a minute, she said, I'll get you the donation. And that kind of hurt. But anyway, she came out and put the money in the, the brother's hand, said thank you for bringing the magazines, and then started back into the house and started to close the door. And the brother said, wait a minute, wait a minute, if you don't mind. She said, what's the matter? Didn't I give you enough money? Think of that. He said, no, that's, that's not the point at all. You gave me enough money. He said, I'm glad you enjoy these magazines. But he said, I'm not here just to deliver magazines. I, what I'd like to do, if you've got the time, is show you how we use those magazines to study the Bible. Now, that isn't going to take you more than 10 or 15 minutes. Have you got that kind of time? She said, you mean there's more to it than this? Oh, he said, you bet your life. Well, she said, come on in indistinct call, right? But then Paul goes a little further in this, giving us ideas to search them out. 
get them to react. In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, another beautiful point has been in the kingdom service. Ephesians 6, and uh, let's read verses 19 and 20. Someone could read that. Sister in front here, uh-huh. Also for me that Adola may be given me without the opening of my mouth, with all freedom of my, of all freedom of speech to make known the sacred service, sacred of the good news, for which I am acting as an ambassador in chains, that I may speak in connection with it with boldness, boldness as I ought to speak. Yes, very good. Thank you. So now here Paul is talking about being bold, and speaking about the sacred secret as we ought to speak. To try to emphasize or uh, magnify what he's conveying here, we were working in a business territory, and it was my turn, went into the place of business, and uh, here comes a man out to see us, and I asked him if he was the one in charge. He said, yes. So I said, well, good morning. How are you this morning? He extended my hand, but he didn't extend his. Not at all. He said, uh, take it back. And as I said good morning, I was smiling. He never smiled. And there was no reaction on his part. And I started to think something in my own mind. And in fact, I talked to the brother that was with me and said, what was going through your mind when we didn't get any reaction from this fellow? He said, well, I was just thinking, let's give him a handbill and get out of there. And I said, I was thinking the same thing. But that isn't what the scripture says to do, to judge them. And, and uh, you decide whether or not they're interested. Paul says we should speak the sacred secret of the good news as we ought to speak. And I was thinking of that. So I went ahead and said, well, l let me tell you why we're here. I know you're busy as a businessman, but if we're going from house to house, we're always talking to your wife. So we thought we'd like to talk to you, and we hope you've got a couple of minutes. Now, we've got an article here that I think you'll enjoy, and it's based on the scriptures, and, and went ahead, showed them some point that would uh, reveal a little bit about the sacred secret of the good news. And after I finished that and showed him a couple of scriptures, now he smiles for the first time. He said, look, I, I enjoy these magazines. I know who you are. You're Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, we are. He said, uh, look, uh, you, you just caught me on the wrong day. This is the worst day of the week for you to come in here. Now, I'm not telling you not to come in. But he said, could you come in like Wednesday, Thursday? He said, I'd have a little time. We can go back in the office. We'll talk. I got some of your books in the office. Love to talk with you. Think of that. Now, if we're not trying to get some thought of the sacred secret across, or we prejudge them, we withhold ourselves from finding some of these prospective precious stones. Isn't that true? And of course, the scriptures help us, like in Proverbs 1.5, uh, Jehovah is showing us that uh, all people aren't going to react that way, but he certainly gives us some insight onto how we can size them up. And what does Proverbs 1, 5 say? Anyone? Please, Madai. Oates. A wise person will listen and take in more instruction, and a man of understanding is the one who acquires skillful direction. Yes. So what does that mean? How does that help us? Anyone? How does that help us in this searching work? Please. This, will, this helps us to appreciate the need to pay attention to what the faithful faith instructs us to apply it in our work. Yes, that's true. That's good. Another application of that? Yes. Also, I mean, listening to them. Listening to them. To. Listening to them. Good. And, uh, sister? If they don't want to listen, then they're not wise. There you go. If they're not listening. Now, here we have... Uh, for example, a topic for conversation was 2 Peter 3, about the promise of a new earth. We've got Revelation 21, which is a beautiful scripture. And then some of them say, uh, 
and maybe this has happened to you, they say, look, I, I got my own paradise. I don't need that. So they're not listening. Here we've, we've let them know something about the sacred secret, but they're not wanting to become wise, not wanting to listen, and they're turning the Bible off. They're not really turning you off. They're turning the Bible off. You could get on other subjects, and they'll talk to you all day. Isn't that right? You can talk to them about family problems, maybe, and you'll never leave the first house. We've often said that. They'll talk, talk, talk. But what is their reaction to the sacred secret? And that helps us determine what we're finding. So it's a beautiful lesson in the searching work. But on the other hand, we appreciate that not all of these prospective or precious stones are found in a door-to-door -door search. Some are found in an informal way. There was a sister that had to get her car worked on and uh, the garage man said well it's going to take at least an hour and a half she said i'll wait she said i need the car this afternoon and she had bible studies was the reason so he said well you can wait if you want there's a waiting room there go in there and sit down so she goes into the waiting room and uh, she takes the truth book out and starts preparing her lesson for the afternoon and while she's reading the truth book, there's another woman sitting here. And she has nothing to read, so she's looking over her shoulder. And she's reading along, and then she started asking the sister some questions. And the sister answered them from the Bible. And after a little while, a woman says, Well, you must be a teacher in some Bible seminary. And the sister said, No, no. I'm just a housewife. She said, I enjoy Bible studies. I enjoy discussions like this. In fact, I'm waiting to get my car to go on a Bible study and, and uh, we conduct them free of charge. She said, well, would you study with me? She said, certainly. Got the address, set the time, and then uh, at the time for the call, she uh, goes to the address and it's a home for nuns in the Catholic Church. <laughs> what would you do? You think, oh my goodness, I got the wrong address. <laughs> no, she felt confident it was the right address. She rang the bell, and out comes the woman, the same one was in the garage. But now she's in her, her uh, Catholic garb. She's a nun in the Catholic Church. And she says to the sister, look, I was serious about what I was saying in the garage. I want to study. Come in. So she goes in, she has a study with her. And when I heard the experience, she was on the platform of the circuit assembly. She's a pioneer, a former nun. There's one of those $10,000 jobs, see? This <laughs> laying right on the surface. Isn't that true? What a thrill to find one like that. So uh, we can understand that when an individual comes into the truth that he really is one of these precious people comes to a point of dedication. But in this uh, Bible study, I want to mention one other thing about it. Um, there was a suggestion in the kingdom service, maybe you're using it, and it says to ask questions before you start the study each time you go. Now, most publishers will say, well, I always ask questions before we start. And I find that they're like review questions, which are good. It gets their mind in gear, and also uh, you can determine whether or not they remember what they studied. But no, this was talking about questions in a different way. Like when you're going to start a chapter, you ask questions before you start the chapter, and there are questions about that information. And of course, most householders will say, look, I haven't studied my lesson yet, and we've already schooled them in reading the paragraphs first, so some of them don't. Most of them don't. It's true, isn't it? Well, our reaction to that is, look, I'm not talking about what you found in the book. I'm curious about what you know about this subject. Example, on that chapter, are there wicked spirits? Now, some have been asked before they start the study, do you know what a Ouija board is? Now, most people will say, uh, I haven't got the slightest idea. What is a Ouija board anyway? Well, we'll get into it as we study the chapter. 
But a few weeks ago, we asked a woman if she knows what a Ouija board is. She said, oh, yeah, I know what a Ouija board is. I got one in the closet. And we work it all the time, my family. It's really interesting. You want me to get it out? <laughs> well, now you know what you've got to accomplish by the time you get to the end of that chapter. Isn't that true? And that's what those questions do for the one that's teaching. You, you know where they stand, what their background is, what they think is true. This is what the Apostle Paul was thinking about relative to what we're discussing this evening. Philippians 2.15. And notice he says that you may come to be blameless and innocent, children of God, without a blemish. That's what makes a precious stone, doesn't it? In among a crooked and twisted generation among whom you are shining as illuminators in the world. So here the individual has come into this position with Jehovah, come out of this twisted generation, come to a point of dedication. You know, the, the phrase, you've heard it many times, the beautiful people. Who really are the beautiful people on the face of this earth? Obviously, they're Jehovah's dedicated people. The ones that he has gathered from the nations and brought them into his pasturing and they're dedicated to him, obviously. Marvelous thought. In fact, uh, let me tell you about another individual. I'll never forget this one I heard, where uh, this fellow was about, well, he was up in his 80s. Brother found him from door to door, and they're going to have a Bible study. So he goes back. This uh, elderly gentleman has the truth book. And when the brother started the study, the older man, he says, uh, you ask the questions. I'm going to close the book. You ask the questions. Let me see if I can answer them. And he answered the first question, second question. He didn't know all the scriptures, but he knew the answers. And they finished the chapter, first chapter in a half an hour. And the brother said, well, that's remarkable. He said, I've never had a study like this. Beautiful. So he said, I'll see you next week. And the, the old gentleman says, what do you mean next week? Let's take another chapter. <laughs> he said, you mean you, you studied too? He said, yeah. So they went through another chapter in about 30 minutes. Same way. And then he says, let's take another one. And they took three chapters. First study. And the brother said, well, what's your hurry? He said, I've never had a study like this. And, and the... The old gentleman said, look, he said, I'm over 80 years old. <laughs> yeah, he said, I've been reading this book. I can see it's the truth. He said, I don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> what a precious one, really. Study like that, loves the truth. And of course, come into a position of dedication. But now this thought of pressure. How do you view pressure? How was it we mentioned that diamonds, rubies, sapphires were formed? Brother? That's right. Tremendous pressure. So now the question is how should we view pressure? Let me read you a little uh, paragraph out of a watchtower. It says that pressure is the key to proving yourself a conqueror. You cannot conquer the pressure of evil just by trying to avoid pressure, leaving a vacuum that Satan and his demons would be quick to fill. Rather, voluntarily place yourself under the pressure for good, and that's what you're invited to do by dedicating yourself to Jehovah. Learn how to view all things from his viewpoint, the scriptural viewpoint, and this is good reasoning and correct thinking. Submissively, Keep under the wholesome pressure of his word and his organization. Wholesome pressure. Now, we know what unwholesome pressure is. That's what drives people to alcohol, drugs. But we're talking about wholesome pressure. What is wholesome pressure? Jehovah says, I formed you. Well... You have been maybe to some watchtower studies, 
congregation book study you've been answering beautifully and so the one that has studied with you says well now look you're able to handle this information quite well so uh, you should be out in the field service with me so look tomorrow morning I'll pick you up about a quarter to nine and we'll head out in the field service and you'll be going out for the first time okay and you remember that <coughs> And many times we said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't rush me. Give me a little time to think it over. And he probably didn't sleep too good that night, even thinking about it. Isn't that right? One brother was telling me that he went out for the first time. He was a man about 50. And he told the brother that he wanted to give the first presentation because I want to see how people react to the way I put it. If I listen to you, I'll be doing it the way you do it. So he said, I'll, I'll take the first door. So then the brother said, well, I'll go with you. I'll go with you just in case you get stuck, and I'll back you up. And uh, the new one says, look, it's hard enough talking to a stranger without you listening to me. He said, I'm going alone. <laughs> and then he told me that when he got to that first door, he was already breaking out in a, in a cold sweat. And he said he just pressed the wall about two inches above the bell. He didn't, he didn't even hit the bell. <laughs> he was so nervous and hoping they weren't home. And then he said he just tiptoed off the porch and got out of there, he said. But then he went to the next house, and of course, he's already been to one, see? So the next house, then he hits the bell straight on, and he got started. Pressure, sure it's pressure. And it's the same way with you sisters. You, some of you may not even be in the school. And the uh, theocratic school overseer says, uh, look, you should be in the school. It'll help you in your house-to-house -house search for these precious ones. It'll make you think on your feet. It'll make you think under pressure. And it's good for you. Just like we're talking about here. Jehovah said, I formed you. So look, I'll give you a student talk, and you can give it in about two months, I'll give you plenty of time, and uh, I'll put your name down, okay? And I know many of you said, look, let me think it over. <laughs> and you didn't sleep too good that night either. Just thinking about it. I remember one brother, he was giving the number one talks in the school, and he was getting so he was doing real well. He was, te he was a teacher. And so the, uh, the body of elders decided to give him an hour talk. This is when they were one hour long. And so they uh, mentioned to him that they've decided that he should give one of these hour talks. And so you're scheduled in about three months. And uh, here's the outline. And he said, look, I, I don't mind giving the 15 minute talks. I'm, I'm enjoying it now. But he said, now you want me to give four of those in a row. He said, I don't think I'd last that long up there. They said, you will. Here's the outline. Get it ready. So he did. And he gave the talk. And when it was over, they asked him how he liked the privilege. Well, he said it was a privilege. There's no question about it. He said, the, the research that I did, I learned so much just getting this talk ready. In fact, I've got enough notes. There's probably enough for six hours. And even to get it down to the one hour. But he said, you know, when I, when I started to give the talk, let me tell you how I reacted. He said, uh, the first 15 minutes was easy, but then 25 minutes, he said, I began to see people yawning, 35 minutes, some of them were falling asleep. I could see the gold in their teeth when they yawned. <laughs> he said, 45 minutes, I, I couldn't believe an hour was that long, he said. 50 minutes, perspiration's going down my back into my shoes. I thought I was gonna die, really. Well, now that same brother gives all kinds of talks, good talks. But how does he get to that point without the pressure? Jehovah said, I formed you. That's right. And that's exactly how he forms his people. And as individuals, just like some of you youngsters in school, a lot of pressure from the other school kids. But by being courageously different, standing up for the truth, you see. So Jehovah's forming you, forming your thinking, forming your conviction, 
forming you as his witnesses, really. And of course, as you develop and uh, react to being formed, then you start to take on a name for yourself. And you become identified. Oh, yes. Just like Jehovah, the scripture says concerning Jehovah that he made a name for himself. And we're not talking about his proper name, Jehovah. Let me uh, have you turn to Nehemiah, the ninth chapter. Now here, Nehemiah is thinking about Jehovah. And what does he say about him? <coughs> Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 10. Now, he's reviewing a little bit about Jehovah and what he did in the past. And in uh, Nehemiah 9, 10 here, he says, uh, regarding Jehovah, you gave signs and miracles against Pharaoh and all of his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted presumptuously against them, and you proceeded to make a name for yourself as at this day. And then down at the bottom of the page, four lines from the bottom, you see, he says, you are a God of acts of forgiveness, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, and you did not leave them. Now, that's what Jehovah meant to Nehemiah. And that's the name that he made for himself in that respect. And the same thing is true with humans. You think of them in terms of what they are. For example, if I mention to you the name Judas Iscariot, well, you see a traitor, an infamous traitor. Isn't that true? That's what he was. That's the name he made for himself. If I mention Delilah, Eve, Jezebel, you can see them, can't you, for what they were. But now you tell me who this is, a preacher of righteousness. Who is that, brother? Noah. 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 A friend of God, Abraham. Abraham, the baptizer, the Nichols, John, and I'm not telling you who these are. It's a name they made for themselves. The evangelist, yes, Philip, Philip. a man after my own heart, sister, David. David. You youngsters tell us who this is, wonderful counselor. Mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Brother? Beautiful, right. Who is this? The Son of Comfort. I read about that just the other day. Son of Comfort. That's what he was to the brothers. Now his mother and father named him Joseph. But they called him Barnabas. It means Son of Comfort. And that's the name he made for himself. That's what he was. And so uh, we can appreciate when Jesus was talking to the disciples, if you turn to Luke, the 10th chapter, he's talking about these individuals that have been formed and how they react. And then they make a name for themselves. Now here in Luke 10, 20, he said, nevertheless, do not rejoice over this, that the spirits are made subject to you. Now, that's the way some people think is the greatest thing. The spirits are made subject to them. But he said, rejoice, because your names have been inscribed in the heavens. Like the beloved apostle. Who was that? Sister? John. John, yes. Beautiful. So you can understand what Jesus meant there. For example, Samson is the name his mother and father gave him. What does that name mean, do you know? It means sunny. He probably brought some sunshine into their life. So they call him Samson, Sonny. Is that how you remember him? Sonny boy Samson? <laughs> Doesn't work that way, does it? Not at all. You remember him as a bold, Vigorous fighter for the truth. That's Samson. That's the name he made for himself. Sarah, Abraham's wife. What a marvelous woman. Went with him wherever 
Jehovah directed him to go, and it wasn't easy. The camel going through the desert, trying to take what belongings they could, what would they leave, yet she went with him. What a beautiful wife. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, I often think of her, and uh, really some of the ridicule she must have taken from people in the world, telling them that she was with child as a virgin. Can't you imagine the reaction of people in the world? In fact, even today, uh, just the other day, I was reading how a clergyman said that she became pregnant because some Roman soldier went through there. She never told Joseph. And that's a preacher said that. So you can imagine what she was up against back there. But she was faithful. And Joseph was a righteous man and appreciated what was happening. Of course, he understood prophecies. And, of course, Jehovah helped him to understand. So what a marvelous person, a gem, really, to be used by Jehovah. So, really, you become known for something, too, whether you realize it or not. You could be known for being very encouraging, always helpful, a good teacher. You could be known for uh, reaching out, like the school overseer has a, a need to fill in uh, on a student talk, and sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so is always willing, reaching out. You make a name for yourself. But you could be known for other things, too. You could be known for begging off. True. You could be known for always late. Meeting starts, and the brothers are saying, where's John? Oh, he's here. He's always late. But you know, the beauty of this is if you don't like your name, you can change it. <laughs> That's right. But when you think of a, a subject like this, uh, you can't help but just think back about individuals that did just that, made a name for themselves. I'm sure that you're probably thinking of some that started the congregation here in Dodge City. Worked all alone, maybe just a handful of them. I think back many times to uh, Brother Russell, 100 years ago, just a handful of individuals studying the scriptures and beginning to see that the giant Christendom is wrong. And now they take on the tremendous responsibility to be in preaching this good news of the kingdom. And Jesus said it's got to be preached in all the world for witness. And there's four or five of you reading that scripture. Well, that's enough to make you quit, isn't it? But they didn't. No, they started out, went to other countries, planted the seed, challenged the clergy, went into debates. Now there's over two million that have been shaken out of the nations that Jehovah has brought into his pasturing. I heard uh, the figure on the memorial this year if I have it right, it's 12,000 short of 6 million at the memorial last spring. All starting back there, of course, under Jehovah's Son, Christ Jesus, His Holy Spirit, and the seed was planted. I never forget the brother that started me out. Now, he was up in years. I asked him if I could go with him. I said, I'd love to hear how people react to what we believe. And he said, sure, you can go with me. In fact, he said, if you want to talk, just chime in and talk. Just be yourself at the door. I said, no, I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to listen. And he said, well, that's all right. So we started door to door, my first time out. And eventually he gets to a young college student. And he's, uh, he's saying things to this college student, and he's, he's listening. But eventually, the college student says to him, look, old man, and he was old. He said, you could talk to me till you're blue in the face, but you'll never convince me there's a God. I only believe in what I can see. And I just stand back, wondering what dear old brother Peterson's going to say, because he was sharp. Well, he said, young man, he said, uh, you're quite outspoken. Maybe you don't mind if I ask you a question. No, he says, go ahead, old man. So dear old brother Peterson, he says to him, well, tell me, have you got any brains? <laughs> oh, I thought that was beautiful. 
because he'd never seen him and it was questionable as to whether he had him. And he says, uh, come on in, old man, let's talk some more. Sure. Beautiful. But now what did he do for me? This, this is the point. Look at uh, Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21 and verse 30. And whenever I read this, I think of dear old Brother Peterson. He was of the anointed, and of course, he's with Christ now. But notice this. Proverbs 21, 30. It says, There is no wisdom, nor any discernment, nor any counsel in opposition to Jehovah. And that's what he told me. He said, Look, you got the truth. And don't you forget it. He said, they're going to ask you questions, and some of them you won't be able to answer, but that doesn't mean you haven't got the truth. Now, you may have to go home, do some research, go back to the drawing board, but even if you stood before a council, the United Nations, they cannot successfully oppose Jehovah God. You have the truth. And I never forgot that, and I appreciated it very much. And, of course, you appreciate the same thing about those that have helped you and given you confidence to stand on your own. But we do appreciate that, yes, Jehovah is forming his people. We feel pressure here and there. Some of you have parts on the circuit assembly program. You're feeling a little pressure. That's right. But it's wholesome pressure. And Jehovah is developing us because very soon now, I appreciate this point in the November 15th Watchtower, where it says we can expect an expansion of our preaching activity now at this climax of the ages, and no doubt before the great tribulation is finished, we'll see the greatest witness to God's name and kingdom in the history of this world. It says the time, no doubt, will come when the message takes on a harder tone, like a great war cry. Revelation 16:21 speaks of the men that blasphemed God due to the plague of hail, because the plague of it was unusually great. And then it says the fact that the plague of hailstones is spoken of as being unusually great suggests that at the very end there will be a hard proclamation of Jehovah's Day of Vengeance by Jehovah's servants. Surely, it says, we need to keep comforting one another and building one another up. So we can understand why uh, Jehovah forms us under pressure. You can take the pressure and stand up and share in the vindication and proclamation of his name. And then you notice here in uh, Zechariah, the ninth chapter. This is Zechariah 9, and a reading of verse 16. And what does Jehovah say about his people now? Well, it says that Jehovah, their God, will certainly save them in that day like the flock of his people, for they will be as the stones of a diadem glittering over his soil. Oh, yes. Precious stones formed by Jehovah, having made names for yourselves, and you will glitter over the soil, as he mentions here, for all eternity, just as the precious stones that he formed leave and remain in the earth for all eternity. So aren't you glad you've yielded to be formed as a precious stone in God's eyes and being formed by him? Thank you, Brother Frank. We certainly appreciated that uh, fine information that you gave us this evening. Just a reminder of the rest of our week's activity. Now, starting tomorrow through Friday, there'll be meetings for fuel service here at the Kingdom Hall at 9 o'clock. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, why, we'll have meetings for fuel service at uh, 1.15 in the afternoon. And just a reminder, too, as Brother Frank mentioned at the start of his talk, if you have Bible studies that you can't change to the afternoon, while well, Brother and Sister Frank and Brother and Sister Berdeen would be very happy to go with you on those studies in the mornings if you can't change them to the afternoon. Remind you, too, to pick up your program. It'll be handed out at the end of the, the uh, program this evening, the end of the meeting this evening, and uh, so you can become familiar with the assembly program.
But we certainly enjoyed this evening, and so we invite all of you to uh, stand, and we'll uh, conclude our meeting by opening our song books to uh, song number 71, and we'll sing, O Walk With God, and then we'll ask Brother Richardson to close our meeting with prayer for us.